We're going to go to Luke chapter 14. And we're going to be looking at a couple of parables today. I'll reference a couple others for your own study. Um, but if we're going to be talking about discipleship, I, one thing I see in Jesus is that he is very clear what discipleship looks like, so you can choose if you want to. And that's something that I think we skip so often. And so uh, once we accept Jesus as a leader and forgive in our lives, by acknowledging with our mouth he's the son of God and believing in our hearts he died rose again and say, you're God and I'm not and I want to follow you, a lot of us don't really go any further than that. We say that, but it doesn't mean it changes everything in our lives. And God should change everything in our lives. So Jesus wants to make sure that we know what we're talking about when we make that decision. So before we start talking about discipleship, in his parables, he's saying, are you sure? Are you sure? So that's what we're going to be studying today uh, in Luke 14, 25. Again, there's Bibles in the baskets around the room underneath the chairs if you need them. And your version is up and running as well. Uh, it's at Luke uh, 14. And where we're picking it up, it's right after uh, some parables that we looked at not too long ago. If you remember the parable talking about the banquet and talking about us humbling ourselves before the Lord, this is really where that theme came into uh, in, in the beam with the parables. And then there was a, a banquet that Jesus was at. Do you remember this? And it was all like religious leaders and they were like prim and proper and all jockeying for power positions within the group. And then we talked about in that culture at the time that there'd be these hallways around that dinner where people who were either unclean or jacked up or misfits or basically you and I could, would be encouraged to walk these halls and watch this so that we could see what it looks like to be pure and be better and so that we'll aspire to move up. It's a, it's a really hypocritical way of living that Jesus really called out, but that's what they were trying to do. And then Jesus brought the misfit in. Remember the guy with dropsy? He healed him and talked about how he loves misfits and that the, this power position thing that the world plays or sometimes the church plays is crap. Okay, that's kind of what's there. So if you remember when we talked about that, we said that's when the misfits all went, yeah. You know, like he's, he's talking about us. No one's ever really championed us. And because of that, news about him started to spread really quick because there's a lot of us misfits out there, right? That's where we're going to pick up this parable. Verse 25, now, after this happened, this is immediately after, now great crowds accompanied Jesus. And he turned and he said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife, and children, and brothers, and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. You don't hear this scripture a lot. It's not the one fuzzy one. What he's saying is, I've got this great moment of all these people are like, yeah. But he says, but do you get what it really looks like? I'm not here for a popularity contest. I'm not here just to get the most followers or the most people of my church. I'm here because I want to change your life. I'm here because there's a better way of living. And if that's not your number one focus, then this isn't going to work out for you. This is going to be cultural Christianity. This is going to be hypocritical Christianity. And so he says these very strong words that seem pretty off-putting because those who aren't going to struggle with it a little bit I'm going to take him really want to follow him anyways. So, who does he say to hate? Hate your family? That's, that's, that's nice. That's nice on Mother's Day. That's when we usually preach this one. Right? Hate your family, hate yourself, and bear your cross. If you're not willing to put family and himself second, or, or even just discard it altogether, if you're not willing to bear your cross for him, go home. That's what he said to the crowd. That's what he said to the crowd. Why? Because there's a lot of people who love the emotional highs, but that's not all that Christ is. There's a truth, there's a study to it that we have to go through. Now, it sounds extreme because that's what this crowd needed. There's going to be things that we're going to find about discipleship. Uh, when we define it out, there's, um, the way we're going to look at it is there's four different stages of discipleship. And there's different ways that he communicates about each, each stage. This is at the very beginning stage. He wants to be very, very clear um, of what matters. The, the main thing in the whole of discipleship is that if you put God first, 
Everything else falls in its place so you don't have to worry about it. That's what it comes down to. But here for the emotional high, he has to say, I'm first, period. You don't have to think about everything else. I'm, I'm first, period, and I'll take care of everything because I, I care about everything else. That's there. So it's very strong words to shake him up a little bit, but it's also in the, in the fullness of his, um, his full, full um, message. So verse 28 is where he starts getting into the parable. He wants to put those things side by side so we can understand what he's talking about uh, from a spiritual standpoint. And he says, uh, Which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man did, began to build and was not able to finish. So the first example he's going to is building a tower. And that really is pretty pretty open to interpretation depending on who's listening to that because m people build towers for all kinds of different reasons. It could be a dwelling. So if you decide you're going to build a home, a place where you're going to put your stuff, where you're going to protect and you're going to take care of things. If you're going to build a new home, don't you sit down and count the cost of that. Uh, other people built towers for military reasons. If you're worried about getting attacked and you put this defense tower in place, you're, you're, you're going to count the cost of that so that you have a good defense or you have something watching out for you. They have towers that they build for shepherds so that they can see the sheep further away or the lead shepherd with his under shepherd so they can see the flocks and what's going on. Aren't you going to count the cost of what that means business-wise as well as care-wise of your flocks? There's a lot of different reasons that we have within these towers, but they all b come from a vision. And one of the things from a like a church leadership standpoint, or I'm sure it's also within the business world as well. Um, these things that you do build a momentum when it comes to vision. It's one thing for me to talk about the tower when I'm building the tower and the people see the tower coming and they see the purpose of the tower, they get excited, they get behind it. That's where that momentum is coming. But in the case that Jesus is talking about, all that's going on and all of a sudden they say, oh, we don't have any money, we can't complete this. What happens? Everybody's like, Pfft, falls away. And some will mock, mock, will mock on that. I've seen, I've seen church buildings go through this, where they, they're building a new church, and we're going to reach the community, and all these new things come into place, and then um, they can't finish it. It becomes a shell. Um, for you guys have met uh, Bob Buchan, one of my mentors. He's uh, talked here before. Uh, the church that he started in New Albany uh, was with a merge of a group of people that decided to build a brand new church, massive church building. Uh, they were a church of about 200 people, ran out of money and had no idea what to do. And they contacted him and said, can your 40 people merge with us? And they needed a new vision. 40 people aren't going to bring a lot more money, but a new vision to be able to move that forward. So the community is exciting, but it doesn't seem like they're doing too much with it anymore. That's what he's saying. You've got to count the cost to make sure that that vision is going to be foreseen. Uh, the next one that he has here is in verse 31. He compares it to a king going out to encounter another king in war. Doesn't he sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. So once again, the king is preparing for battle. He realizes he can't win. He doesn't go out and just get his guys slaughtered. He goes out and he sends up the white flag. So that's what he's talking about, is surrendering. He says, doesn't he go out and make terms of peace? Doesn't he surrender? And now they're under that new king. Don't they have a new life now that might be better or might be worse than what they have before? because it would be too costly to keep on trying to go the, the way that they are going. That's what he's talking about here. If I'm living my life and I'm doing it the best I can, best I can, and I keep running into walls and I keep feeling like I'm being tossed to and fro from every situation and what other people think of me or what happens to me, then maybe it's worth surrendering to the Lord giving up everything to renounce all that I have so I can be a disciple of this new king. Maybe that's what the cost is. So he's saying to her, you guys are excited. This is great. I love this energy. But be sure. Be sure. Uh, we were at um, the, Emily's in show choir, and they had show choir competition. 
yesterday at Olentangy. And when they do the awards at, at this one, it's like a big gymnasium, and then they got all the students on the bleachers that side and all the students on bleachers this side and the families, and it's packed and it's overwhelmed. And at this particular one, they usually have like a half an hour of just pure fun chaos for the kids. And so they're playing music and the kids are having their own dance party out here. Every single year, I don't know if they ship this kid in. There's always a two-year-old that comes out and dances and everybody claps. They're so excited for the two-year-old. Different two-year-old every year, but, huh? I don't know. I just know I always see it in all the tangy. And part, part of you thinks it's cute. Part of you wants to shoot the kid with a BB gun. Part of you is... <laughs> it's, can, Huh? That's, that's Jenny. And, and part of you is like terrified because it's like, oh, look at the little kid, look at the little kid. And a new song comes in and then like hundreds of students come out to, to dance on this child and they get killed. Uh, but it's just like this big mass of energy. And they, um, there's always this one school that always tries to start stuff. So they start doing the, you know, the queen thing. Here, you guys do that. You got to stop because you can't hear me. Go. I'm, uh, Terry thought I meant sing, but that's okay. Okay, now you do that with like, I don't know, 500, 600, 700 kids. That's loud, okay? Yes, very exciting. Or they'll start the wave. Everybody gets up. Everybody. Think okay, Monica start it? Do you, you suck? Going across, going across, going across. That's not how it, okay, that's how it starts. They always have this great moment that lasts like a minute and a half. And then the next thing you know, there's only like f sporadic five or six people still doing this, and then they like, I do this. So you, the wave becomes like two people here, three people there, one person there. I never do it. Um, because that little emotion has passed, like there's nobody still leaning it. That's what Jesus doesn't want. Uh, he, he can have a great time of doing We Will Rock You for a few minutes, and then people just stroll away when something else grabs their attention. He's had enough hypocritical Christians. The world's had enough hypocritical Christians. He's had enough cultural Christianity. He, the world's had enough of cultural Christianity. He's looking for real things. He's looking for real people that are truly, truly in. Um, look at some of the things that he's talking about as, as far as uh, the family and ourselves and our class. Uh, I, I just was jotting out some notes when you're talking about family. Uh, to me, home, family is my comfort. So I sacrifice my comfort to him. But I, Sacrifice my selfishness to him and me controlling my time, my finances, my relationships, me having my goals versus having his goals. Um, me, the challenges, taking and trying to carry the world or carry the cross. Either way, there's all kinds of challenges and he's inviting us to a different lifestyle. But we've got to choose that we're all in. We've got to choose that we're all in instead of just doing a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit there. So, not that warm and fuzzy yet of a message. A little bit of a warning. It won't get real warm and fuzzy for after this either. Uh, but I do want to give you a couple other parables if you want to watch them uh, go through them at home. Um, Luke 17. I don't have the actual voices, but you'll find them pretty quick. Uh, Luke 17 and Matthew 20 are the, the two that I'll, that I'll give you. Um, I, with a little bit of a warning. Again, as I talked about the four different stages of discipleship, these parables fall more in line with maybe chair two or chair three, stage two or stage three, uh, instead of stage four when we look at Jesus' ministry. So they're very specific um, to that particular stage of our learning and our being. And if you don't realize that, these as well could come off harsh. These as well could come off harsh. Luke 17 um, is... Um, Basically, Jesus is saying, if you have a servant, and your servant goes out and works in the field all day, and he comes in, he's had a long day of it, do you say to him, hey, sit down, brother, get, you know, have, get, get something to drink, have some food, you worked hard, or do you say to him, serve me my drink, serve me my food, and then you can have your dinner? And that's what they did. And so he, he was trying to teach us our servanthood um, place when it comes to being a servant, which is, again, more, more uh, stage three. The, um, the awesome thing in that is he does say, sit, rest, here's your food, here's your drink. But it's a little bit different order than maybe what we want to put it at for ourselves. Uh, Matthew 20 um, is the one, you might have heard this one, where let, let's say that um, Nate has a, f a field that needs to be cleared out and it has to be done by five. So Nate goes out and about six o'clock in the morning, hires 
let's say 10 guys. 10 do it? Okay. 10 guys. Says, I'll pay you 100 bucks a piece if you come out and clear this field. And so they come out at 6 and they start working. About noon, he realizes it, it, we're not going to make it. We're not going to make it. So he goes out and hires another five guys and says, look, if you'll come out and work until 6 p.m. today, I'll give you 100 bucks a po- each. And so they come out and they do work and he gets down to 5 p.m. and he's like, whoa, my goodness, we're just not. So he goes out and hires five more guys and says, listen, if you'll come and work for an hour, I'll give you 100 bucks a piece. And as you would guess in this parable, the guys who got paid 100 bucks for the full day start getting a little lit. That these guys who come for an hour get the same pay that they do. And Jesus says, why is that? Why is that? I gave you a price. I was fair to you. I, uh, what's it to you if I decide to be generous to some other people? That, that's kind of that servanthood one that he brings into place that whether or not I've been serving my whole life or somebody comes to him late in life, we get the same reward. And why, why should I be bitter about that? Well, the only reason I'd be bitter about that is if I'm thinking about me. Am I getting honored enough? Am I getting my due? Those are the type of things that he brings in to think about from servanthood. But we're going to go uh, to Matthew 7 for the, the rest of this particular study. So if you go to Matthew 7, we'll be in verse 24. It's kind of nice to get to Matthew. Matthew and Mark, most of their parables have to do with the kingdom of God um, instead of the, the side areas of how to live the kingdom of God now. Um, Luke is kind of chocked full of nuts, but it's kind of nice to get a little Matthew in here as well. And in this area that we're coming into, it kind of starts talking a little bit about the with them. Um, anybody know what with them is? I'd be really surprised if you did. If you did, you remembered me bringing it up like seven years ago. Bonus points, bonus points. Anybody? I can't stand any of you. Did you finish? Did you finish the? Okay. Good job. Um, okay. <laughs> Nicole was in on that too. Um, WIFM is part of the uh, Crosby Quality Assurance Program. Anybody? Anybody? No? Okay. Uh, it was, which I uh, was certified in at a previous job. And um, it's the truth that from our worldly self standpoint, we generally look for what's in it for me. That's what WIFM stands for, what's in it for me. So from a business standpoint, if I'm asking you to do overtime this Saturday, What's in it for you? Uh, overpay, whatever, whatever they a- add into it. We're going to have donuts that day, whatever the case may be, right? This is where we're starting to get into the standpoint of if I give up everything, then what's in it for me? And I'm saying that because there's somewhere in our hearts that we think about that, but it's a horrible way of thinking about it. Because it's not about me, it's about him. And that's where we're going to call, start seeing some of these things in this place. The section we're coming into in Matthew, we studied about eight months ago when we went through the Sermon of the Mount, the teachings of Jesus. And this is the very last part of the Sermon of the Mount. So he has been teaching them about attitude, purity, salt, being the salt in the world, being light in the world, love, generosity, prayer, fasting, proper judgment, anxiety-free living, uh, seeking, it's about bearing fruit in our lives. About, he's been teaching us about kingdom of God living, which is what's in it for me. Which is what's in it for me. I can have a life that he designed for me instead of trying to work against that because that's the only option that we have if it's not leaning into it. So then at the end of that, this is what he ends with. This is the parable. He says, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house. And it fell, and great was the fall of it. So now he's talking about discipleship where we're going to start building something. And we're talking about it from a standpoint of building on the rock. The first thing to make sure you have, if you write anything down, write this down. Building is a conscious choice effort that I make and I commit to. Building building is not something that happens happenstance. uh, And it's not something that uh, we can take lightly. If I'm building a house, I choose to build a house. Okay, first off. 
it's not going to stand. Uh, I'm talking about an actual house because I have no idea what I'm doing. But it, I, I know people that can do that kind of thing. I've got a Jenny's cousin and her husband built a beautiful log cabin out in Prospect, and he knows what he's doing. Beautiful, beautiful house. He was there every day. He was making decisions focused off of that house and wh what the time schedule is going to be, how it's going to affect his finances, how it affects his friendships and his relationships and who helps and who does not help. I was never asked. Uh, <clears throat> that it's a very conscious choice effort that you do. If you hire somebody else to do it, you might drive by every once in a while. I, I don't ever want to build a house. Because it's stressful to me to buy a house. So if all I have every once in a while when I'm stressing out is to go by and look at a hole, it does nothing for me. It's one thing to see a house I'm buying, I guess. But, but here, to build a house, it changes everything for his life until that's done. And he's saying, if you're going to build a house, and we're all building something, either by choice or not choice, either consciously or by being lazy, while building something, if you're going to be a house, to build it on the solid foundation. How do you do that? I don't know how to build a regular house. I do know how to build a house of God in my life in discipleship because he tells me right here that anyone who listens to my words and actually gets off their butt and does it is building a house. Anybody hears these words of mine and they don't try to struggle with it because they're not comfortable with it. Anybody who takes and doesn't say, oh, I just, that's somebody else. I don't want to do that, God. If you actually hear the words and do it, you're discipling. You're building something that is rock solid. From the point that we accept Jesus as leading and forgiving our lives, we're making a choice on what kind of house that we're building from that. Now, three things come. Rain, floods, and winds, right? Both stories. Three things come. And I'd be surprised if anybody here can tell me that they have never had rain, floods, or winds beat the crap out of them, right? So I, I just, again, just doodling a little bit, some things that bring rain into our life. And depending on how hard they hit you, they can go in any category. But uh, just feeling empty, being lonely, feeling like you're alone, uh, issues at work, people gossiping about you, struggling with just dealing with people socially. Um, a failure that you go through it was rain that comes into our lives floods in our lives health problems a lot of times can become floods it's not just a little bit of a struggle like I, I I'm diabetic but it doesn't affect my life that much I don't have to take insulin or track my numbers those type of things all the time but I'm having um, some time with my brother Matt uh, he's been my best friend since fifth grade I've talked about him several times uh, was recently diagnosed again with cancer for the third time in his life um, this time it's stage four in his pelvic region. Uh, he has low energy, uh, has a lot of pain in his hip at all times. He's, he's two weeks older than I am. Um, and we're getting together because they have told him it's not, it's, it's managed, we can manage it, but it's never, you're not going to heal, heal from this. Outside of miracle Jesus, he's not going to heal. And they don't know if he's got five years, 20 years. He just doesn't know. He's wife, two kids. Um, it's ra raised on him. Um, and they have told him that the symptoms he's feeling at this point are not going away. They're not going away. That's more flood than me and my little sugar diabetes at this point in my life. So sometimes health, health problems can become major. Uh, grief, if we lose someone that we love. Uh, financial struggles, complete ruin can be a huge flood. Um, someone stabs you in the back. I think there's a little bit of just in gossip and someone actually stabbing you in the back. Maybe you've lost a job or other people in your life because of winds blow and beat. Yes, they do. Mental health issues, trauma, uh, work life, debt, bankruptcy, whatever the case may be, things come. Things come. And the, the, the thing that Jesus tells us is it doesn't matter if you're a Christian or not, things come. The question is, will you stand? That's the only question is will you be able to stand? Um, the opposite of that um, is I've got it mentality. I can do this. I can just, just pull up my my bootstraps or your pants or whatever you pull up, I guess. But I can do this. I can fix this. Um, rain, you find somebody to hang out with. Next thing you know, you're alone again because they left you. Uh, floods, death of a loved one. I don't know how uh, we were talking about... Um, 
with a friend of mine. She just recently lost her mother, uh, and we're, we're praying for the family. Um, and we were talking before church, and I lost mom about three years ago. And uh, I don't think you can understand that kind of loss until you go through it. I don't know what it's like to lose a spouse. Uh, but to a parent, that, that was something I continue with. Um, I don't know how people grieve without hope. I hear that so often at funerals, without the hope of Jesus Christ. And a lot of people have to go through that without him. Wins um, after an attack or maybe something that you go through dealing with PTSD uh, in your life can be very damaging, very overwhelming. Uh, that's what the world offers to us. And it, you don't have to believe me on that because everybody sees it in their own lives. We're not stupid. We, we see that happen over and over again. I think one of the biggest things, like people talk about what pastors struggle with, and uh, I think one of the biggest things I struggle with is hurt for people who live this way. Uh, I get called, or PM, or let's go get coffee, pretty often from people who are struggling with loneliness and I need to get back with God and I need some you know Christian community around me and I need to get back with God uh, and probably 60 70 percent of the time um, they get plugged in they start being with God they make some friends in the church uh, they find a community there it starts going the right direction they meet a girlfriend they meet a boyfriend that now fills that need they walk away from God, they walk away from church, and you reach out to them, they're like, well, I, I don't need that now, I've got a girlfriend. I'm not alone anymore. Okay, let's talk in six months. I mean, just time after time after time after time again. And it's not just with those kind of relationships, it's just I found something in the world to fill this need, and then they come back more damaged than they, they were loved upon. Um, the difference is we, we get to make make that decision if we stand or fall, and great is the fall. Great is the fall. Um, so we have two scenarios here. They both have the same factor within that on whether or not we will stand. And uh, I believe Jesus is taking and saying this is serious. It is life-changing, and I'm begging you to come home. I'm begging you to hear the words. I'm begging you to put them into place. I'm begging for you to build your house on the rock because it breaks his heart when it goes otherwise. He loves you more than that. We've already saw all oh, great worth just a couple of weeks ago with the parables. Oh, great worth. He loves us dearly. He's sitting on the front porch waiting to see us come back over the field. The only question is whether or not we will choose to purposely and consciously hear the words, follow the words, grow in the word so that our house stands for my sake, for my wife's sake, for my children's sake, and for my church's sake, for community's sake, and for his name's sake, will I stand? It's interesting, and um, when you look at the timeline of when Matthew wrote his gospel and Luke, his, his gospel, and um, the why not these things that happened before, and then you look at the culture that they're dealing with now, like what's going on in the world, why they're writing these things down. And... Um, why th at this point that they're writing things down, it's a very strong probability that this would be a time where the church understands what falling apart means. In uh, 70 AD, so what, 35 years after Jesus was on this earth, Rome destroyed Jerusalem. Rome just destroyed it. They they came against them. They got tired of the, the, the life that we see in the Chosen. They got tired of all the, the different politics and stuff. And Rome came out and just basically annihilated them from three sides. And then the fourth side on that wall, uh, the, 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 the Jewish people tried to fight back and they held them for a little while. So it ended up taking a few months just in that, that area of the battle. Um, but they paid a heavy, heavy price for it. Um, According to Josephus, if you're not familiar with him, he's an early church historian, uh, not in the Bible, but he was within the first, second century, uh, that over a million people were killed uh, in Jerusalem during this time. Uh, the situation got so bad that they, went, uh, they had massive problems with murder, uh, massive problems with uh, theft, and it got to a point that for a small season, they were having problems with cannibalism, of people trying to survive. Um, so it was a very ugly, ugly time 
that the synagogue had gone through. In this, as you may know, the synagogue got wiped out. Uh, every single rock of it got wiped out. It was all put together by gold that was melted, and then it held all the stones together. Um, and the Romans wanted that gold, so they destroyed the synagogue, <laughs> took the gold, and that is what paid for uh, the Colosseum in Rome. So if you ever see pictures of the Colosseum and whatnot, that was paid for with the destruction of the, of the temple. Again, everything you see in Chosen, Hallmark movies, that kind of stuff that you see in the Gospels about Sadducees, Sadducees were done when this fell apart. The, the rituals of cleansiness and uh, sacrifices were wiped out. There was no synagogue anymore. The, 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 the realm of the religious leaders that we see in Jesus' time was greatly, greatly, greatly diminished because their holy city was taken from them. And so they know what it looks like if we're not following God, what it looks like for everything to fall apart, let alone their own persecution in their life. Now, the reason I find that interesting is Palm Sunday is coming up here soon. And there's um, a section. You can go there if you want to. You don't have to. It's Luke 19, uh, <coughs> verse 41. There's a section that's part of the Palm Sunday where Jesus is riding the donkey into the city, right? And this is the third time, or one of three times, that we see what Jesus weeps. And verse 20 it says, when Jesus drew near to the city of Jerusalem, before the destruction, so he's looking upon the, the temple, he's looking upon the synagogue, um, the, the community, he saw the city and he wept over the city, saying, would that you even had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they were hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear down to the ground you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. What is Jesus talking about in 33 AD? What happened in 70 AD? Because you wouldn't listen, because you wouldn't accept me as the Lord, because you wouldn't hear my words, because you wouldn't follow my words, this is going to come upon you. Not something I want. It's not something I'm weeping over. It's not I'm begging you to listen, but they wouldn't. And it all fell apart. And now, in this case scenario, he's saying to you, quite frankly, this is your day of visitation. Oh, if you would just listen. Oh, if you would just submit. Oh, if you would just build by using my words, what a difference it would make. And you don't have to go through that, those walls falling down against, uh, around you anymore. They'll come, but you'll stand. This is the day of that visitation. So as we go into discipleship, we don't want to do it haphazardly. It's just, oh, this is just something we study because we're the church. It's an invitation from the Lord that we either do or we don't do. Now, I know because we're human, there's going to be people that dabble in and dabble out. And I'm praying that it'll get you through that. I mean, I'm praying that like you hear something on like some day when you're just dabbling in and go, holy crap, and dive in. I, I, I'm praying for that because um, I hate seeing that when people fall again because they held on to the wrong foundation. But for those who claim it and do it, I'm looking forward to this next season with you guys.